Okay, now we're going to talk about an exemplar related to the concept of perfusion. We're going to be talking about hypertension. Now, the slides on the video will not have the page numbers attached, but the page numbers will be on the slides on, that are located on Blackboard. So head over there and follow along as you go. Uh, grab your textbook, your notes, and here we go. So hypertension is an incredibly common condition in the United States with over 78 million patients having uh, hypertension. Unfortunately, not all of them even know they have it. Only about 87% are aware that they have it and 75% are on blood pressure medications, but only 50% of those are well controlled, which means there's a lot of patients out there with uncontrolled hypertension. In addition, 70 million more Americans have pre-hypertension, which is a warning sign that it's going to get worse if something it doesn't change. We'll talk about that as we go. So you can see on this slide that normal blood pressure, according to the American Heart Association, is a systolic of 120 and a diastolic of 80 or less. Now systolic is the maximum amount of pressure in your arteries at any time. It's when the heart is contracting and forcing blood through the ventricle out into the circulation. And the diastolic, the low number, um, is, the, is the amount of pressure, the minimum amount of pressure in the vasculature system at any time. And that's based on how much pressure is in your arteries between the beats of the heart. Now you'll see here that there's different levels of hypertension, um, pre-hypertension, high blood pressure, hypertension stage two, and then a hypertensive emergency or crisis. So go ahead and read for uh, yourself what these different levels are. Now there are a number of different risk factors for high blood pressure. Um, age is certainly a factor. 65% of Americans, 65 and older, have high blood pressure. Um, and African Americans are at higher risk of prevalence and also at higher risk from um, have, having uh, major illness and even dying from high blood pressure. Socioeconomic status is also impacted. The lower someone's social economic status, the higher their risk for hypertension. And although uh, high blood pressure affects men and women equally, it seems that men are more likely to get it early before age 45 and women tend to get it later in life after age 65. Now I want to get into the pathophysiology of high blood pressure. In other words, what causes high blood pressure? So in order to really understand that, we've got to talk about a few terms first. So what you need to know is that our blood pressure number that we get is a combination of cardiac output times the amount of resistance in our vasculature system. So cardiac output times peripheral vascular resistance. So what is cardiac output? Cardiac output is the amount of, uh, of blood that your heart pumps out in, over time. Um, and so we calculate that by stroke volume, meaning the amount per beat times the heart rate, the amount of beats per minute. And so stroke volume, how much blood is pushed out of the heart when it uh, contracts in each beat times how many times it does that in a minute, the heart rate. So cardiac output is one component of our blood pressure. And then peripheral vascular resistance um, is the other part. In other words, when the heart pushes blood out of that left ventricle out into circulation, how much resistance is it facing as it does that? How much resistance or tension is there in the arterial system? And so peripheral vascular resistance um, is determined by how tight or how wide uh, those, those arteries are in our our vasculature system. So um, if, if our blood pressure is regulated by our, is determined by our cardiac output and how much peripheral vascular resistance we have, then high blood pressure is caused by anything that will elevate either cardiac output, heart rate, or stroke volume, or something that elevates the peripheral vascular resistance, the amount of tightness in the arteries. Let's take a look at that even further. Okay, so we know that blood pressure is uh, going to be impacted by cardiac output and by peripheral vascular resistance. So um, what increases cardiac output? 
Well, a, heart, a high heart rate will increase cardiac output, um, and things like stress can cause a high heart rate, um, and thing, or uh, having too much fluid in the system can cause an increased stroke volume and also tachycardia. So if we have stress, um, or if we have too much fluid in our body, those are two uh, factors that impact our blood pressure. So we want to stay stress-free and we want to monitor our fluid in our body. Uh, a couple things that cause fluid volume excess in the body is too much salt intake. Because remember, salt and water are best friends. Um, or someone who has poor renal or cardiac function is also at risk for having too much fluid. Too much fluid and your blood pressure is going to go up. So in, in addition to fluid volume and stress, the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, or the RAAS system, also increases peripheral vascular resistance, squeezes down on those arteries, and increases stroke volume. Remember, stroke volume is how much blood is pushed out of the heart with each beat. Um, and so the, we're going to talk a little bit about the system and how um, this renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system increases peripheral vascular resistance and increases cardiac output, therefore impacting our blood pressure. So I want to introduce you to this renin-angiotensin-aldosterone renin system in two ways. First, I'm just going to show it to you as words on a slide, and then I'm going to demonstrate it for you with some pictures. So the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, or, or RAS, increases blood pressure. That's what its job is to do. And it starts with a hormone in the kidneys that the kidneys release called renin. So renin is the first trigger that kind of activates this cascade to increase blood pressure. And so renin is activated by the kidneys and released by the kidneys. And it's triggered from three reasons. It's triggered if the patient's blood pressure is low, which is a good thing. Um, it's triggered by our systemic, our, sorry, our sympathetic, sympathetic, Sympath our sympathetic nervous system, there we go, um, like from stress or from a low salt diet. So if we have low blood pressure or low salt, or if our sympathetic nervous system is triggered, renin will be released by the kidneys. And so when renin is released, it activates other hormones in the body to raise blood pressure. Specifically, it activates angiotensin II. Um, it triggers the adrenal glands to uh, release aldosterone, and it triggers the pituitary gland in the brain to release ADH, antidiuretic hormone. And all of these um, cascading hormones cause increased blood pressure. How? It causes the um, blood vessels to vasoconstrict, to squeeze down. So smaller tube with the same amount of fluid running through it is going to increase the pressure. And it also tells the kidneys to hold on to water and to not diurese as much water. So we increase the amount of fluid in the vascular system and we squeeze down on the pipes and make them smaller. And those two things together are able to increase someone's blood pressure. Now, if you are being chased by a lion and uh, you're fighting for your life, then having this reaction from the um, RAAS system is great. Um, it's going to vasoconstrict your blood, your blood vessels, tell your kidneys to hang on to water, and give you the you know needed boost you need in that fight and flight kind of um, situation. But sometimes this, this whole raising the blood pressure system can get us in trouble. And that's what happens with hypertension. I'm going to show you one more way to look at this pathophysiology. So let's take a look now. Okay, so I want to show you this renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system um, through a diagram of how these hormones work. So remember, um, renin is produced by the kidneys for one of three reasons. Um, either it's released because the body sensed that the blood pressure is low, or it's triggered by the sympathetic nervous system. That's our fight or flight stress system. Or there's not enough sodium in the blood 
uh, floating through the kidneys. And so those three reasons will cause the kidneys to release renin. When renin is released, it mixes with, um, there's, a, there's a, a cascade here of steps, but we're going to skip a couple of those. It mixes with uh, hormones from the liver as well as activation from the epithelial cells to create angiotensin II. Now, the epithelial cells are the cells that line the inside of all of our vascular system. All of our veins and arteries are lined with epithelial cells. So renin plus these um, hormones from the liver plus these epithelial cells all activate angiotensin II. Why is that important? Well, because angiotensin II does four things to raise blood pressure. The first thing it does is it tells the smooth muscles of our body to constrict. Um, when we constrict our, our, our vascular system, all of our veins and arteries, we make them smaller. And if we have smaller vasculature, it means there's the same amount of fluid going through a smaller amount of area, so it's going to raise the pressure. The second thing it does is tells our kidneys to hold onto water. Now, if our kidneys are holding on to water, it's going to increase our blood volume. If we have more blood, our stroke volume is going to go higher. The amount of fluid that our heart pumps out in each beat will elevate, which will increase our cardiac output and increase our blood pressure. So those are two things that the angiotensin does directly. But it also works through um, activating hormones from a couple glands in our body, specifically the pituitary gland, which is located in our brain. And I know it looks like testicles, but that's literally what the pituitary gland get, looks like. So just get over it, I guess. Um, and so the pituitary gland is activated to release, release antidiuretic hormone, ADH, and ADH does both of the same things that angiotensin does. So we're doubling down. It tells the, um, the veins and arteries to constrict, increasing the peripheral vascular resistance, and it tells the kidneys to continue to hold on to water. Now, the last gland that we need to talk about is angiotensin II activates the adrenal glands. Adrenal, ad meaning on top, renal meaning on uh, kidney. So these two little glands sit on top of our kidneys and activate aldosterone. And aldosterone also tells our kidneys to hold on to water, increasing blood volume, therefore increasing the, st the stroke volume and cardiac output. So um, the anything with a sunburst on here are our hormones that are involved. So it's renin, angiotensin II, ADH, and aldosterone are the four uh, hormones that are involved in the system that both increases our cardiac output and increases our peripheral vascular resistance, therefore increasing our blood pressure. Okay, to summarize. Long story short, hypertension is high blood pressure and it's caused by either too much fluid or constriction of the arteries. And these conditions are triggered by either too much fluid, like from too much salt in your diet or poor renal function or poor cardiac function, or just too much stress in general. So signs and symptoms um, are going to be things like headaches, chest pain, blurred vision, dizziness, fatigue, some pretty significant nosebleeds, um, shortness of breath, and renal failure. Um, the kidneys don't do well with hypertension over time. But the reality is that hypertension is considered a silent killer because you can have pretty bad um, organ failure before you even realize that you have high blood pressure. So these signs and symptoms are pretty late stage symptoms. Typically patients with mild to moderate high blood pressure don't feel anything. They don't know that they have it. Now, diagnosis of high blood pressure requires um, high blood pressure readings at at least two office visits. And then patients will be diagnosed with either pre-hypertension, stage one, stage two, or hopefully not hypertensive crisis. Um, but it takes at least two office visits to really diagnose someone with hypertension. So how are we gonna treat them? Well, the first thing we're gonna encourage is lifestyle modifications. Um, diet and exercise, eating a low salt diet with lots of fruits and vegetables, um, and staying active, monitoring salt intake, 
can all really help with blood pressure. And if someone's just mildly elevated, like a systolic blood pressure of 120 to 129, that may be enough. And that's typically where we start. But if someone has stage one, stage two or higher, um, high blood pressure, we typically um, start the patients on medications as well. So let's talk a little bit about the medications that are indicated for high blood pressure. The first one is diuretics. I mean, we've talked about these already in class, but diuretics are going to help diurese the body or get rid of fluid. Diure diuretics drain fluid from the body. And here are some just general considerations for diuretics as a whole. You want to give them in the morning, not at night, because they cause someone to use the toilet frequently to urinate. And so we don't want a patient to be woken up multiple times at night to use the bathroom, so we start these in the mornings. And we want to encourage the patients to change positions slowly because all blood pressure medications have a risk for orthostatic hypotension. Um, patients should weigh themselves daily and report any weight gain of two to three pounds in a single day. And patients on diuretics are prone to sunburn, so encourage them to use sunscreen. If we're trying to get rid of water, remember water and salt are best friends, so we need to decrease sodium so that we don't overdo it on the water. So patients on diuretics should definitely be on a low salt diet. Now in terms of administration, here are some things we need to consider. Um, if we give, if we push IV diuretics too quickly, the patients can get hypotensive and they can also have ototoxicity, um, uh, loss of hearing. So we push it slowly as indicated. Also, if we give too much of it, meaning if they're on it for a long time, patients risk um, nephrotoxicity, damage to their kidneys, um, as well as hypokalemia, low potassium. So we're going to study and learn about specific hypertensive medications in class, but for now I wanted to talk about some general considerations um, when we're thinking about hypertensive medications. You never want a patient to stop them abruptly, uh, never have them double up on a missed dose. Any of these things can drop their pressure too significantly. Um, all blood pressure med medications can cause erectile dysfunction and something patients should be aware of. And our priority teaching is regarding safety. Specifically, patients can have orthostatic hypotension if they're on a blood pressure medication. So they need to learn to change positions slowly so they don't get dizzy and drop their pressure. Now, in terms of administering antihypertensives, if their blood pressure is less than 90 over 60, or if their heart rate is less than 60, we're going to hold these blood pressure medications because they lower blood pressure and can lower their heart rate. So that's kind of the key number there. 90 over 60 or less than 60, don't give that dose, hold the dose, and reconsider later. Now, in terms of other management that we can do, of course, lifestyle management is going to be really key for managing hypertension. So encouraging the patients to get to a healthy weight with a normal BMI and a normal waist circumference um, has indicate, has studies have proven that that decreases high cholesterol, high blood pressure. We want to encourage a low salt, healthy diet full of fruits and vegetables, low fat dairy, lots of fiber. Um, we want to encourage people to not over-consume alcohol. Um, high levels of alcohol consumption are um, correlated to hypertension. We want to encourage patients to engage in regular exercise, which lowers blood pressure, and to reduce stress, meaning cut out too much things that are going on in their life or engage in activities like meditation and yoga um, to engage the parasympathetic nervous system and to decrease blood pressure. So when patients have complications related to hypertension, it's because of hypertension over a period of time. Over time, hypertension damages organs. We're going to see the heart become enlarged, cardiomyopathy, and an enlarged heart is not good at pumping fluid. Um, we can see kidney failure and strokes and heart attacks. 
and hypertensive crisis. Um, and again, um, high blood pressure is considered to be the silent killer. And so we want to encourage patients to maintain good blood pressure, even if they don't notice any signs and symptoms from their blood pressure, because there are really significant risks when blood pressure is left unchecked and untreated for a long time. And as always, let's go ahead and go through the nursing process as it pertains to hypertension. So in the nursing process, in terms of assessment, there are typically no symptoms until the disease is advanced, which is why it's important that we're regularly screening our patients for high blood pressure um, and having conversations with them. Now, in terms of nursing diagnoses, the problems that we can identify, um, patients with high blood pressure are at risk for ineffective therapeutic regimen management. In other words, they may not do the diet and the exercise and take their medications as they're supposed to um, and have some noncompliance. They're also at risk over time for something like decreased cardiac output because their heart muscle becomes um, big and boggy and not effective at pumping if it becomes enlarged. So what are some nursing assessments that we're gonna make? So any patient who has hypertension, we know that they've got an underlying perfusion issue. So we're gonna do a good perfusion assessment for them. We're gonna check their neurofunction to make sure they're awake, alert, and oriented. We're gonna check their vital signs, including blood pressure and heart rate. Um, we're going to have them do regular eye checks to make sure that their vision isn't being affected. We're going to listen for bruises, putting our stethoscope on their carotid arteries specifically, and listening. We should not hear any whooshing sounds. That means that there's um, a lot of um, plaque buildup and narrowing of the arteries there. Um, we're going to palpate for edema and palpate their normal pulses, uh, assessing for the quality of their pulses, looking for labs, specifically looking at kidney labs, the creatinine, the BUN, um, the glomerular filtration rate, which is GFR. Um, when we start seeing those become abnormal, it shows that the kidneys are not handling the high blood pressure and are starting to have some renal failure. And then finally, we're gonna look at their BMI and waist circumference. We want patients to maintain a healthy weight and have a, a, a normal size waist um, because when either of those are elevated, it increases risk for hypertension and patients are gonna have a harder time controlling their blood pressure if they're not controlling their weight. All right, now in terms of interventions, it's always actions to take, assessments to make, and teaching to do. So in terms of actions to take, of course we're gonna administer medications as ordered, and we're going to encourage patients to have that DASH diet, that low salt diet with lots of fruits and vegetables, and encourage them to be exercising as well. Now in terms of teaching, um, again, this is a chronic condition that needs to be managed over time. So we need to teach our patients to adhere to their medications. Um, we need to teach them how to adhere to lifestyle changes and adapt those to things that are gonna work for them. Mon teach them to monitor their blood pressure at home and to look for those signs and symptoms of complications and know when they need to seek care. Finally, how do we evaluate? How do we know that um, we have a good outcome for these patients with high blood pressure? Well, a patient who is being managed for hypertension, if they're managed well and they're doing their diet and exercise and monitoring their sodium intake, they should have increased energy and they should have um, an absence of a headache. They shouldn't have any blurred vision or dizziness. Um, those are all types of things we wanna see over time for these patients. And that's going to wrap it up for our chat about hypertension. We'll be covering this more in class. Thank you so much for listening and have a great evening. See ya.